tales for dark nights. Come one, come all to our matinee of madness, and partake in this theater of the mind. Welcome to the Simply Scary Podcast, Season 1, Episode 2. I'm your master of ceremonies, G.M. Danielson. For this presentation, we serve up beings who exist on the edges of our known reality. These are the beings that many of us unconsciously and instinctually fear with all our hearts at the darkest of times. They seem to surround us constantly, and while we may not know it, we may still feel it. And no, I don't mean ghosts. That to which I am referring are the antithesis to all that is good and holy. The religious class insist these beings exist beyond life and death. They exist from a time before the world had form. They are demons. They are ancient. And they are legion. We will begin this excursion in a moment. But first, I would like to allow our producer, Jesse Cornett, to share a message with you. (laughs) Thank you, GM. We hope you're enjoying this demonic episode of the Simply Scary Podcast. I just wanted to take a moment to remind you that your support is essential for our productions. To lend your support to all we do, go to simplyscarypodcast.com after the broadcast and click on the Patrons link at the top of the page. Not only will you help us create more Simply Scary content, but you also get access to the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights audio library, and you will assure that we are producing brand new material to assault your ears. As a bonus, when you become a patron, we'll also feature never-before-released material you will get nowhere else, and you get first access to new productions. Every subscription helps us to scare you. So visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and support the kind of entertainment you deserve. And now, back to your host, G.M. Danielson. Thank you, Jesse, for that important information. And now, it is time to begin. For our opening act, we go deep underground. Subways and tunnel transportation provide public transport, but they are notorious as magnets for the less stable among us. And that can make an average person feel, well, uncomfortable to say the least. At every turn, there is a new intrusion into your personal space. Zealots proselytizing to non-believers desperate souls that resort to panhandling to fill their empty bellies, and a criminal element with predatory instincts. For the protagonist in our first presentation, any of these would be vastly preferable to what he encounters coming home this night. Jeff Clement commits a stellar performance and learns from author Michael Marx that he sees you. He Sees You Written by Michael Marks Performed by Jeff Clement She walked up to me, bright-eyed and smiling, 
as I stood in the crowd waiting for the train. Her mouth was moving, but what she said was a mystery. The misfits blasted through my headphones, a ritual of mine intended to mask the noise of the busy commuter trains. Excuse me? I pulled the headphones from my ears and raised an eyebrow at her. He sees you. The girl's eyes locked with mine, wide open and dilated to the point that her pupil seemed to swallow her iris. Um, what? I gave her my best, what are you on, look. He sees you. He wants you, she said matter-of-factly. The smile never wavered from her face. The small blonde girl was starting to creep me out big time. My first assumption was that she was drugged out of her mind, but she didn't look like the typical druggie. The girl wore a cleanly pressed red suit, the skirt hemmed just above the knee. She was draped with diamond jewelry and wore a haircut that probably cost more than my education. Who? Who sees me? I pressed. Maybe it was the way she was dressed or... Maybe it was the way she carried herself, but this level of crazy didn't seem to fit the person. I decided to indulge her another minute before I put my headphones back in and returned to my usual don't engage the crazies mode. He sees you. She retained the same strange expression, a smile plastered onto an otherwise emotionless face. I stared at her a few more seconds, waiting for her to elaborate before finally giving up the game. Okay, lady, time to get back on the meds. Or off the drugs. Whichever. I shoved my headphones back into my ears and turned away from her dismissively. I was just in time to hear Danzig launch into the chorus of skulls, and I fell back down into my own little world. It was hardly my first time dealing with some drugged-out nutcase during my nightly commute. Ignoring them was usually the best possible response. At some point, I realized that the girl was still standing exactly where she'd been before. I could see her staring intently at me from the corner of my eye. After another moment, she turned away from me and headed back through the crowd in the direction she'd come from. I shook my head in disbelief at just how whacked out that seemingly put-together lady really was, and turned my music up to deafening levels. A few minutes later, I boarded the train. As per my usual routine, I walked to the last car and went to sit on the top level. As I settled into my seat, I saw the blonde girl walk through the doors into my car. Her two wide eyes fixed on me immediately, and a Looney Tunes smile corrupted her pretty face. I quickly shifted my eyes to look out the window, pretending not to register her presence. But I felt, rather than saw, her climb the stairs. The top level of the train car was nothing but a row of single seats on either side with a railing and a luggage shelf shared by both sides hanging from the ceiling. She went to the opposite side of the car and sat a couple of seats back from where I was. I didn't look, but I swear I could feel her eyes on me the entire time. There were ten stops between the main station we were pulling out from and my stop in Dentonderry. With each passing of a platform, I would glance behind me very briefly and casually, hoping to see an empty seat where she'd once been. But at each station, I was disappointed. The girl would be there, leaning out of her seat, eyes wide and staring, mouth smiling. She was making me nervous, and I found myself glancing back at her more and more often, and with less subtlety. Her expression never changed, and her eyes never faltered from mine. I became increasingly concerned and unsettled that in a train car this crowded, nobody seemed to notice this psychopath staring me down, or at least no one acknowledged it. The other commuter's eyes were fixed downward, wrapped up in their own little worlds, ignoring my situation entirely. I counted down the stations, growing increasingly panicked the closer I got to my destination. When the train finally slowed down at my station, I bolted from my seat and took the descending steps two at a time. The instinct to get away from the stranger was so overwhelming. I'd never felt so uncomfortable in my life. The way she looked at me, it was like she wanted to eat me. I was the first one out the door and into the cool night air. 
I leapt down the steps of the train station and walked briskly out into the street. I chanced to look back, and when I didn't see the girl following, I slowed down a fraction and took a deep breath, laughing to myself. I pulled the headphones from my ears and took out the cigarettes from my pocket. Lighting a smoke, I watched the train pull away from the station, its whistle echoing and fading as it went on down the line. Sayonara, psycho! I said aloud and saluted the quickly departing train. It was a ten-minute walk back to my house, and I found myself walking much more quickly than usual that night. I could still feel her eyes on me, and I couldn't get her out-of-place smile and odd mannerisms out of my head. I smoked my cigarette and did my best to forget the whole encounter, ultimately failing, and before I knew it I was standing at my front porch. The outside light had been broken for a while and the house stood a dozen yards or so from the street, leaving the area in complete darkness. I shuddered involuntarily. She's gone, I told myself. It was just some crazy addict, that's all. Someone else's problem. Just because a meth head can dress herself doesn't mean she's not a couple beers shy of a six-pack. I took one last drag from my cigarette and then flicked it to the pavement, then walked up the stairs to my porch and found myself enveloped in an even deeper darkness. I fumbled in my pocket for my house keys, eventually found them, and then struggled to find the right one. I felt rushed, as if all the evil in the world was suddenly bearing down on me. I nearly broke into an insane sort of laughter, but I found the right key just before the madness overtook me. I pulled open the screen, ready to vault inside and flip on every light in the house. Then I felt a tap on my shoulder and heard the familiar voice of the stranger. He sees you. Before I could react, she was on me. She wrestled me to the ground with what felt like the strength of a person three times her size. I felt all the air leave my lungs as my back connected with the unforgiving surface of my concrete porch. My hands grabbed wildly at her, trying to find purchase as she straddled me, a considerable weight set upon my body. My eyes, which were quickly adjusting to the darkness, took in the familiar two wide eyes and two animated smile. He sees you, she repeated. He wants you. A calm voice, a matter-of-fact voice. The more I tried to push her away, the further she leaned over me. For a girl her size, she was sporting a superhuman strength. Since she'd first attacked, her eyes had somehow grown even wider and whiter, and I found myself staring into the embodiment of pure madness. Her mouth had changed shape for the first time since I had seen her. It opened wide, and her jaw appeared to unhinge like some kind of snake. I screamed for someone, anyone, to help me as I continued to claw at her. And then something came writhing out of the darkness of her wide open mouth. In pure shock, I shot my hand up under her chin and tried to push her mouth closed. I felt something like tendrils wrap around my wrist and little traces of slime drip down my arm. I see you. This voice was different from the stranger's. It was guttural and deep. It was the sound of something ancient and dead, and it came not from the woman's mouth but from inside my own head. This was the end, I thought. In a last, pathetic attempt to save my own life, I took one hand off of her face and searched the bare ground next to me, trying desperately to find my keys. Her gaping maw drew ever closer to me, wider still, threatening to swallow me whole. Just as her upper lip touched my hairline, my fingers happened upon cool, sharp metal. I snatched the keys up and shoved the largest one between my middle and ring finger. With all the strength I had left, I punched the key into the side of her head, and then I did it again. At first she seemed unfazed, even as I felt drops of her blood drip onto my arms and face from the repeated stab wounds I'd created in her cheek and temple. Then the key found a much softer target, pushed in deep and caught her eye. 
The scream that echoed forth was something shrill and primal. No human could make that sound. Nothing living could make it. She released me and scrambled to her feet, hissing as she cupped her damaged eye. Then, before I could even get to my feet, she vaulted off my porch, clearing the steps in a single jump, and disappeared into the row of elms across the street. I sat up on one elbow, catching my breath and staring at the tree line for God knows how long. I could feel something oozing down my hand and covering my knuckles. The realization that it was fluid from her eye snapped me back to reality and I got to my feet and into my house as fast as I could. I slammed the door behind me. That night and every night since, I've triple locked all of my doors and windows. I draw the shades and I keep the lights on at all times of day. The porch light is fixed and I try to never get home after sundown. The nights when I do find sleep, it's usually thanks to whiskey. I keep a shotgun next to my bed. When I close my eyes, I see her stiff, unnatural smile and her black, whole eyes. I don't know what she was or where she went, but I do know one thing. She's still coming for me. This morning, I received a text from a number I didn't recognize. It was only six words, but they filled me with more terror than I ever thought I'd feel again. He sees you. He wants you. So, we learn you can fight the dark spirits that come after you. You can even win. For a little while, at least. But you only have a short lifespan to resist them. So unlike you, they have forever. After this short break, we will meet a group of young people as they are about to make the most dangerous mistake of their lives. Hello there, listeners of the Simply Scary Podcast. My name is Ashley Arndt, and you can join myself and the rest of the Chilling Tales for Dark Knight's Evil Idol contestants for the final round of Evil Idol, where you decide who the winner will be. Be there Monday, October 31st at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, and listen as we perform live some of the most frightening tales we can dig up and take part in choosing who will win the coveted grand prize package. I will see you there so you can help us turn off the lights and turn on the dark. The chilling tales for Dark Knight's live stream events are to die for. This Halloween sounds like it will be no different. Now for our next presentation. Young people can feel invincible. For like a good many of us, they may have been sheltered while maturing. Often inevitably, that sheltered existence can become stifling, and many of them may venture out and court danger just for the simple thrill. When the five young people in this tale go out and seek some thrills for the supernatural, they learn just how vulnerable their existence really is. Steve Gray performs for us author Andrew Harmon's Snow Angels. Snow Angels by Andrew Harmon Performed by Steve Gray Part 1 It began when Tommy G decided we were going to emulate a Wiccan ritual he found in one of those old books from his attic. We were kids. Suzanne, Reggie, Tommy G. Franco, and I. 
Reggie and Franco were the oldest at fourteen while the rest of us were all still a year younger. This adventure was the product of a string of snow days after a blizzard. Without school to keep us busy for seven hours a day, our parents bundled us up and turned us loose on the winter world. There was a small tract of woods less than a mile from my house with a clearing you could get to if you knew where to find it. We agreed to meet there, each of us bringing a component of the ritual squirreled away somewhere in the multiple layers of our fleece and downy jackets. Suzanne brought a few candles. Reggie got his hands on a knife from his dad's workshop. I brought a can of red spray paint and Franco brought a lighter. Tommy G, the ringleader, brought the sacrifice, his pet snake, Sissy. We gathered in the clearing later that afternoon and Tommy G laid out the plan. We spray painted a ten-foot pentagram in the snow at the center of which sat an old stump. Suzanne put her candles around the base of the stump and Reggie struggled against the wind to keep them lit. At Tommy G's instructions, we all stood at the five points at the edge of the pentagram while he recited what he called a holy incantation. The ritual was supposed to let us see people's guardian spirits. As the biblical symbol of evil, the snake would allow us to see the otherwise invisible divines around us through its sacrifice. I can't tell you how cold that clearing felt. Sure, it was February, on the tail end of a cold snap that buried our little midwestern town in two feet of snow but the chill I felt started from the inside and gnawed its way out. I was sweating under all those layers, but my stomach felt like a block of ice. The wind whipped through the leafless trees and blew out one of the candles as Tommy G was finishing the last of the incantation. Maybe that's what went wrong, or maybe it was all a fuck-up from the start. Either way, the five of us marched in unison from the edges of the pentagram to the stump at the center. Tommy G pulled an Aldi's bag from somewhere out of the depths of his coat and sat it atop the stump. I could see the agitated snake writhing inside its plastic sack prison. Reggie handed over the knife and Tommy G cut Sissy free and laid her atop the frozen stump. We must have stood in silence for a solid minute, just stealing nervous glances at one another. Tommy G pinned Sissy's head to the stump. Sissy wriggled uncomfortably against the freezing wood. Finally... Reggie said that Tommy G wouldn't do it, and Tommy G responded by taking action. He pressed the knife's edge down behind Sissy's skull and smashed the blade down like he were chopping a carrot. Suzanne yelped. Sissy's decapitated body twisted and rolled itself into knots before falling limp into the snow. A stream of blood leaked down the side of the stump and stained the snow bright red. No one said anything for a while. Then Franco muttered, Fuck, and went to dry heave in the woods. Suzanne sat down and began to cry. Reggie, Tommy G, and I just stood motionless around the stump, staring down at Sissy's head. I is that all? I asked. Yeah, Tommy G said hollowly. That's all. No one mentioned that we weren't seeing any spirits. We fled out of the pentagram and crowded together at the edge of the clearing. That ice block in my stomach had expanded into a certified glacier, and I felt like I would vomit any moment. Reggie took his father's knife back and frantically tried to rub away the blood with snow. I guess after a while, the awkward silence became too much for Franco because he wadded up a snowball in his gloves and chucked it at Reggie's back. That seemed to break the spell because in no time we were all dashing around the edge of the trees, pelting each other with snowballs and ducking away from incoming fire. Eventually, we began to laugh again and pushed the memory of the ritual out of our minds. Kids can do that somehow. A heavy snow started just as the sun was going down. We had wanted to build a snowman but didn't have the time, so we decided we'd all make snow angels in the clearing instead. We spread out in a row so that our angels would line up like chorus dancers. Tommy G lay down, then Franco, and Reggie, then Suzanne, and me at the end. We pushed the imprint of our bundled-up bodies into the snow and waved our arms and legs. Just as I was finishing up mine, a surge of fear and coldness rushed through me, made me convulse where I lay. I turned my head to say something, and woven behind the sheet of falling snow that blasted down around us, I saw the faintest outline of a human-like figure glide behind Tommy G. It was there, and then it was gone. It was nothing, really, but it was definitely something. A blur in the background, 
a slight smudge of the world hushing by just behind Tommy G. Tommy G saw me staring and asked what my deal was. I announced that I might have seen a guardian spirit. Reggie and Franco booed and jeered. None of them wanted to bring up the botched ritual. Tommy G looked like a kicked puppy because he had just remembered that he had killed his only pet. Tears were welling up in Suzanne's eyes again. I told him I was just joking. I didn't mean any harm. Nighttime was creeping over the world, so we all packed up and hiked back home. That was on Friday. The weekend passed by, and none of the five of us saw each other. I woke up on Monday morning feeling surprisingly refreshed. The sun was just rising outside my window. I was nestled into the warmth of my comforter with the gentle drone of the heat moaning in the vents. It was 8.30 in the morning, and my mom had let me sleep in due to a two-hour delay. When the school bus picked me up, all of my classmates were chatting and running amok. Five days with no school had filled us with rambunctiousness that could not be contained. We joked and laughed and took turns talking about how we wished another blizzard would come and bury the whole school in snow. The bus was so busy and chaotic that none of us even noticed Tommy G wasn't there. In fact, I didn't notice myself until third period when I sat at an empty table in English class. Tommy G sat behind me, and we'd usually spend the whole hour passing notes and dirty doodles back and forth. At lunch, I asked Franco and Reggie if they'd seen Tommy G, but no one had. He must have been homesick, the lucky bastard. The day dragged by, but eventually we all got dropped off on the corner, and Reggie, Franco, Suzanne, and I stood on the sidewalk shivering. We decided we would head over to Tommy G's place to give him a hard time about playing hooky. When we got to his house, the driveway and curb were both packed with cars. We figured his parents were having a party, but we'd stop by if only for a minute. Standing on the slick porch, we rang the doorbell and waited. After a few minutes, an older man we didn't recognize answered and asked what we wanted. His eyes were puffy behind his glasses. We told him we had come by to see Tommy G, and he ushered us into the foyer without a word. Inside, the mood was beyond solemn. People we didn't recognize were milling about and talking in whispers. What's going on? Reggie asked. Well, the man said, then paused to consider his words. He removed his glasses and wiped at his eyes. I don't know if I'm the one that should be telling you this. Telling us what? I asked. The man stared at us for a few seconds, then seemed to accept the burden of delivering bad news. He said, Tommy's family was in a bad car wreck. He cast his eyes into the living room where all of the sad people were roaming about. I... I'm afraid to say... Well... <clears throat> he cleared his throat. I'm sorry to have to say that, uh... Tommy didn't... survive. The four of us kids just stood there dumbfounded. We were waiting for something to tell us this was just a cruel joke. We hung in that surreal moment like flies encased in ice cubes. Suzanne's face scrunched up into an awful grimace. Tommy and his family were killed, the man said. H How? Franco mumbled. Tommy had a bad head injury, the man said. I stared into the living room at all the people glancing over at us. Just around the corner, I heard someone say, brain hemorrhaging, under their breath and the person they whispered it to gasped into their hand. How can I put into words how empty we all felt walking down that driveway? We took turns looking at each other with blank faces, and then tears began to stream down Suzanne's cheeks. My eyes swelled up as well, and I turned my head to wipe the tears away before they froze in the wind. None of us said a word. None of us could think of anything to say. We just split up and trudged home over the icy sidewalks. When I got to my house, I stopped and turned to gaze into the woods down the street. I couldn't stand going into my house. I knew my parents would see the pained look on my face and start asking questions. If I told them about Tommy G, I would absolutely break down. So before I had to face that, I wanted to return to the clearing. I wanted to stand in the place where I had last spoken to Tommy G, where we had thrown snowballs at each other and laughed and trounced around in the snow. The woods were dead silent. That harsh winter wind tore through the branches and whipped my cheeks beat red. 
I found Sissy's headless body at the edge of the clearing where Tommy G had thrown it before going home. A light dusting of snow covered its black scales. It was frozen solid. The spray-painted pentagram had faded also, and the candles were toppled over in the drift. On the opposite side of the clearing, our five snow angels remained, but I noticed something strange from a distance. I approached them slowly because in my mind I already knew what I had seen. As I stood over the five snow angels, I began to tremble uncontrollably because there, where Tommy G's head had laid, the snow was stained bright red. Part 2 Reggie took Tommy G's death the hardest. The two had been inseparable. Reggie grew up poor and in a pretty rough household, so Tommy G's place was where Reggie went to escape when his parents argued and screamed. He wasn't at school the next few days, and we understand why. That Friday night, we all met up again. Reggie, Franco, Suzanne, and me. Franco had a little clubhouse in his backyard that his father had built for him and his brothers. It was still so cold that we sat for a while in silence, watching our breath hang in the air. I wanted to tell everyone about what I had seen in the clearing. I wanted to say the words brain hemorrhaging like I had overheard at Tommy G's wake and then show them the red snow that stained the head of Tommy G's snow angel. But I thought it was stupid. The red color might have come from anywhere. Maybe it had gotten on the hood of Tommy G's coat after he decapitated the snake and I just hadn't noticed it when we first made the snow angels. I don't remember what we even talked about. We were preteens that had just lost a close friend. How could our young minds express what we were feeling? But I do remember when the night ended. Reggie was headed back to his apartment. The opposite direction is me and Suzanne. Maybe that's why Suzanne decided to tell me, because it was the first convenience of being alone with one of us. I saw something, Susan said out of nowhere. What do you mean? I asked. There was about a half a mile of sidewalk between us and our houses. We would have to pass the forest on the way. In the clubhouse, I saw... She was staring down at her feet as she spoke. She clamped her arms tight to her sides and drove her hands deep into her pockets. Something is all. Well, what was it? I asked. What do you think of the ritual we did, Andrew? She asked. The image of the blood-stained snow angel's head flashed in my mind. I didn't say anything. She asked, Do you think it worked? I remembered then what I had seen in the clearing that Friday, the blur of movement that whisked by behind Tommy G through the wind-driven snow. I wished desperately that that memory was more vivid. Even at the time, I couldn't say I really saw a person. It was just a, well, a hollowness in the air. Yet somehow, I recognized it as a being, something that moved with purpose. When I didn't answer, she asked again, Did the ritual work? Have you seen any spirits? I spat, sharply. I didn't want to tell her what I knew. Suzanne was touchy and prone to crying. I wasn't going to be the person that set her off. Maybe. She said, I, I don't know. I stopped walking and stared at her. After a few steps, she turned and met my eyes. I asked, what do you mean, maybe? Back in the clubhouse, I think I, I, I saw something, she said. What did you see? I asked. She shrank back a bit because I had become suddenly animated. I think between us we knew there was something not right going on. It was nothing, she whined, but there were tears starting to form in her eyes and I knew she wanted to say something. I whispered, Suzanne, it was just like a shadow. Well, no, not a shadow. It wasn't dark. It was clear, she said. Where? I pried. Just as we were leaving the clubhouse, you and I were still inside and Franco was heading up to his porch, and I saw Reggie going around the side of the house. I saw Reggie going around the side of the house, and it just flew right past him. Like... like steam? 
or like a piece of glass? I asked. She was beginning to tremble because she could see that I was nervous. Yeah, like steam. It was just... She saw the sleeve of her jacket across her running nose. She was hollow. She? I asked. A knot had worked its way up my throat. Yeah, it's stupid. I just... I felt like it was a woman, Suzanne said. I went back to the clearing after we found out Tommy G died, I said. Yeah, so? She said. I saw something there, I said. I turned and looked off toward the woods. The sun was beginning to set, and it was too late for us to venture off into the clearing and back before it grew dark. I must have been staring too long without saying anything because Suzanne stomped her foot on the icy pavement to get my attention. Tell me, she demanded. I don't want to tell you. I think I should show you, I said. Then show me. It's too late tonight. We can go tomorrow. Meet at my house and I'll take you out to the clearing. Should we tell Reggie and Franco? She asked. They'll think we're nuts. And I don't think we should be bringing up Tommy G around Reggie right now, I said. Just you and I. We met early that Saturday morning, and it had snowed a little overnight, and I was afraid the snow angels would be buried. Suzanne dressed light for the weather in a powder blue sweater and tight jeans. Her brown hair was pulled back in a ponytail, and she had a blue headband that covered her ears and most of her forehead. It dawned on me for the first time that Suzanne was cute. She was the sporty type, not quite a tomboy, but not exactly a girly girl either. I wondered why I had never noticed the faint freckles that spanned the bridge of her nose. The forest was silent as we hiked towards the clearing. The trip took about ten minutes maximum, but I recall that I never heard a single bird or squirrel the whole way there. I heard our heavy breathing, with the vapors of our exhalations billowing up into the dead branches. Now and then some snow would crash down on the ground, somewhere in the distance. But all in all, this little tract of woods seemed lifeless. Surprisingly, the clearing looked like it hadn't gotten even a dusting of snow. Sissy's headless body still lay frozen on the edge of the clearing. The blood that ran down the sides of the old stump had darkened to a sick brown hue, and the spray paint of the pentagram was still visible on the snow. I grabbed Suzanne's wrist and led her across the clearing. There laid our five snow angels all in a row. Tommy G's, then Reggie's, then Franco's, and Suzanne's, and my own at the end. What is that? Suzanne squealed. I had led her to Tommy G's snow angel, and she was staring down where Tommy G's head had laid, and it was still dyed bright red. I, I think... My breath shivered out between my chapped lips, and I glanced over at Suzanne's face. I think it's blood. Oh, no, she moaned. She covered her face with her black gloved hands. No, no, no. She took a step away from the snow angel with each utterance of the word. Where did it come from? Whose blood? I don't know, I said. I came here right after we left Tommy G's house on Monday. And it was here. I didn't tell anyone because I didn't bother finishing my sentence. Do you think it has anything to do with... Neither did she. We both turned towards the old stump and Sissy's severed head. That's what I wanted to tell you. About the things you saw yesterday. I said. I sat down in the snow and pulled my legs up against my chest. I, I saw it too. You saw it? Yes, well, no, I said. I saw one here, in the clearing. When we were making these, I jerked my head towards the five snow angels. It was snowing really hard and windy, and something just floated by. Suzanne and I were staring into each other's eyes. It was a serious stare, the depths of which were just sussing out between us, behind Tommy G. We both mulled it over in our heads for a few minutes. Then Suzanne walked back to Tommy G's snow angel and stared down at the red stain again. Then she began to cry, and she was trying to keep it quiet. So I pretended I didn't notice. An immense emptiness flooded my insides. It was helplessness. 
I felt like a balloon whose air had all been squeezed out of him by the pressing cold and I was left sagging there atop the snow, waiting to fully deflate and be buried by the next blizzard. What the hell is this? Suzanne asked. It snapped me out of my trance and I looked over. She had moved from Tommy G's snow angel and was staring down into Reggie's. I stood up and trudged my way over to her side. I couldn't figure out what I was seeing either. It's... Suzanne got down on one knee and pressed her fingers into Reggie's snow angel. It's ice. She was right. A solid sheet of ice had formed inside Reggie's angel, as if someone had filled the imprint halfway with water and let it freeze overnight. We looked to our left and right. Franco, Suzanne, and my angels were untouched, and Tommy G's still had that wicked red stain on its head. What, what do you think it is? Suzanne asked. I think we better leave, I said. The return trip through the woods was just as eerily silent as the first had been. Now and then, one of us would snap a twig hidden somewhere under the snow, but even the wind was mute as we trekked towards home. Neither of us could think of anything to say. When we got back, Franco was waiting for us on my porch. He was staring at the ground. When he heard us coming, he looked up with an expression that read nothing but pain. It's Reggie, he said. Here's the account of Reggie's death the way I heard it. His parents were out drinking that Friday night and left him home with his two cousins. His cousins were seventeen and sixteen. The winter had given them all cabin fever, and so they decided to roam around Reggie's complex. There's a big man-made lake out behind Reggie's apartment, and it had been frozen over for weeks. They were a band of reckless kids and decided to see if they could walk out to the middle of it. The oldest cousin was up front, then the younger one, and Reggie trailed along a few yards behind. Reggie's cousins are big, not just tall, but heavy too. They must have both had a hundred pounds on Reggie. But it wasn't the largest one who was leading the column towards the center of the lake. It wasn't the younger one who was shuffling along a couple steps behind. It was Reggie, the young one, the skinny one, whose weight broke through the icy surface of the water. His cousins say they heard the loud snap of the shattering surface. But by the time they turned around, Reggie had vanished. Where he stood was a jagged hole clogged with chunks of ice. There wasn't any thrashing or screams for help. Reggie was there, then he was gone. They swept the snow away with their gloves to see if they could spot him struggling down below. But there was nothing in the murky black. The oldest cousin thrust his arm down into the hole, up to the shoulder, and fished all around. But there was nothing to pull up. The police brought in a diving team and they plunged down into the hole one after another. When they pulled Reggie up a half an hour later, the skin was completely blue and his arms were frozen stiff around his chest. Part 3 Franco was sick to his stomach when Suzanne and I told him about the snow angels, about the brief apparitions that both of us had seen just before Tommy G and Reggie died. He traversed the whole spectrum of emotions, anger that we had kept it secret, unabashed sobbing when the guilt of his taking part in the ritual surfaced, and then terror that his own snow angel laid right next to Reggie's. At that revelation, something in him broke, and he began to laugh. We thought he was crying again at first, but then he tossed back his head and guffawed, and slapped his knee and sighed in a relieved way. Franco didn't have a death wish. Something had gone wrong in his head, and we should have been more proactive because Suzanne and I both knew it. Franco was the kind of kid that always had things go his way. His parents spoiled the hell out of him. He was handsome and charming and was graced with beautiful blue eyes. He was a teenage heartthrob just a few years short of blooming, and now, suddenly, he was just the next in line. Some time passed, a couple weeks. We were in the first days of March, and while it hadn't snowed much, freezing temperatures kept the grounds covered. We hadn't been back to the clearing since Reggie fell through the ice. I couldn't stomach to see the red stain on the head of Tommy G's snow angel or the two-inch sheet of ice pulled up in Reggie's. What none of us said, though, was the real reason we were avoiding the clearing. No one wanted to see if there was something on Franco's. We just ignored it. The three of us tried to go through the motions at school, but even school had become a grim place. Two students died in the blink of an eye. 
The teachers carried on as if everything was normal, but their heart wasn't in it. The students still chatted and joked and passed notes, but even our laughter was the guilty, hollow kind. Everyone treated Franco, Suzanne, and I different. We could do no wrong. There were offers of assistance for every mundane task we came across. I caught people's glances in the cafeteria when the three of us sat together, none of us eating much, none of us talking much. Franco was especially quiet. He just sat doodling most of the time and none of the teachers said anything about it. He didn't turn in homework. He half-heartedly scribbled answers on exams. Franco was a different person. There was Franco in the hallway with mismatching shoes. There was Franco in the cafeteria flooding his lunch tray with ranch because he forgot to let off the pump. There was Franco sitting in his front yard, jamming a stick into the mud. I felt bad for him. One day I pulled Suzanne aside and told her we had to do something. Sure, we were still pretty messed up about Tommy G and Reggie too, but Franco was facing something we couldn't understand. Maybe we were just making assumptions about the nature of this ritual we botched, but empirical evidence suggested that our punishment was moving in a definite order, and in that order, Franco's death was the next stepping stone. We showed up to his house with a cake. Yes, this was the best that our preteen brainstorming could come up with. Surely, we thought, some fucking sweets would turn things around. His parents ushered us into the house, smiling hard because they worried about what their son had become and were glad to have help from his friends. We found Franco in his room, just sitting there. No music turned on, no magazine in front of him. He conducted himself as if he were in death's waiting room. We circled around him, then joined him on the floor, setting the cake in front of him. Franco just sort of nodded, then returned his gaze to the wall. Franco's parents had given us some paper plates and some plastic forks, and Suzanne held the knife out to Franco and asked if he wanted to cut the cake, and at the sight of it, Franco lunged like a cat against the wall. He tripped over half of his belongings, scrambling around the room. I shot my hand out to Suzanne and pushed the knife down to the carpet. Franco was nearly hyperventilating. We just stared. It was quiet like that for a minute or two. Then all three of us laughed. And we laughed hard. Franco got the best chuckle of us all and cracked jokes at his own expense, pretending to claw his way up the wall, making hissing sounds. It seemed like everything was back to normal. But then Franco started talking about some weird thing lemurs did that he read about in National Geographic, and he stopped mid-sentence because Suzanne was staring at him with her eyes as wide as headlights and her lower lip quivering, and I looked up where she was looking and saw it. Something between a cloud of vapors and a woman was kneeling behind Franco. There was no face to make out or clothes that I can describe. It was just as if a human had been painted in those squiggly lines you see in the air above hot pavement on a summer day. Franco was asking us what our deal was when the spirit unfurled a pair of wings the width of a truck from behind her back and hugged her ethereal arms around Franco's shoulders. Franco said we were giving him goosebumps all of a sudden. Franco, Suzanne whimpered, it's here. Guardian angels are a legend that says when people are in trouble, divine spirits will intervene on their behalf. It was supposed to be a sign that a person's time hadn't yet come. The ritual with the snake and the pentagram and the candles and the incantations that was supposed to let us see guardian angels. But we were seeing them all wrong. The spirits, these wisps, these mirages, they weren't guarding anybody. They were announcing death. No, worse yet, they were setting death in motion. Would Tommy G have been in that car crash if there was no ritual? Would Reggie have fallen through the ice if no one had lopped off Sissy's head? If we weren't such gullible and reckless children, would Suzanne and I have seen Franco innocently shivering in this evil spirit's embrace? Franco was in bad shape. He was shaking like a leaf in a tree. He was pale. He was fighting back tears, and he kicked the cake across his room, and he took the knife we were using to cut the cake, and he threw it out the window. Franco marched into the bathroom down the hall. From behind the locked door, he gave us instructions. We had to go to the clearing and see what had become of his snow angel. 
He was just too scared to join us. It was safer if he just locked himself up in the bathroom and did nothing. Not a single thing. He was sobbing so hard we could barely make out the words. Now and then he would lash out with screaming and cursing and beat his fists against the counters. Suzanne and I left in a hurry, not bothering to tell his parents what was going on. Franco's house was the furthest of all of us from the clearing. I grabbed Suzanne by the elbow, and the two of us jogged our way towards the woods. Twice, Suzanne collapsed mid-step and sat shivering on the pavement. I wiped the tears from her eyes. I told her we didn't have time to cry yet. It took us fifteen minutes to get to the entrance of the woods. It took another ten to find the clearing. And when we did, there lay Franco's snow angel, the third in line. And it was a sickening sight. A pile of brackish green bile was freezing in the center of the snow angel. Neither of us could tell what this ugly goop was, but it gave off a putrid chemical smell, and there were little powdery chunks of something mixed in it. I got a stick and churned up the slimy puddle. It was stringy and sticky like mucus. When I disturbed it, the god-awful smell became overpowering. Suzanne and I had to walk away and collapse in the snow to catch our breath. What is it? Suzanne pleaded. What does it mean? I don't know, I yelled. I was furious. Is Franco going to die? Suzanne asked, her voice crackling. I beat my fists into the snow and began to rock back and forth on my knees. A headache pounded inside my skull. I don't know, I said. I grit my teeth and scrunched up my face and groaned, as if terror were a physical wound stinging in my chest. I don't know. What Suzanne and I did know was that we really didn't know anything. In the realest sense of the cliché, we were messing with forces we did not understand. What good did it do for the two of us to come to the clearing? What good would it do to know that Franco's death was imminent when we didn't know how or why or when it was coming? We must have sat there in the clearing for twenty minutes, each of us just silent with our thoughts. After a while, I pulled Suzanne up to her feet. We've got to go tell him, I said. Would you want to be told? Suzanne asked. I don't know. We didn't get a chance either way. By the time we got back to the house, Franco was being loaded into the back of an ambulance. His dad hugged his arms around Franco's wailing mother. She looked up at us with tears running all over her red face, but didn't say anything before they climbed into the ambulance with their son. Turns out, Franco couldn't handle the potential of his own death, and he took matters into his own hands. He was locked up in the bathroom, and shortly after we left for the clearing, Franco just started swallowing down whatever cleaners and solvents and pills he could find in the cabinets. His dad kicked down the door when Franco didn't respond and found him on the floor surrounded in empty bottles of Drano and sleeping pills and toilet bowl cleaner. At the hospital, they pumped his stomach, but it didn't help. He was in a coma for a couple of hours, and then all his organs failed in a hurry. Just like Tommy G and Reggie, he was there one minute, and then he was gone. Suzanne broke down and told her parents everything. Then all hell broke loose in our little town. The local papers printed headlines about five teenagers performing black magic and sacrifice in the woods. The nightly news instructed parents on how to spot signs of Satan worship. I was ostracized at school when I eventually returned to classes. No one sat with me at lunch or spoke to me in the halls. The teachers regarded me like an ugly stain in their classrooms. Suzanne was pulled out of school and sent to live with her grandparents in New England. I never got a chance to say goodbye to her between Franco's death and her departure. I watched from my bedroom window as her family's SUV, packed to the brim with luggage, pulled out of the driveway and sped off to the airport. I was grounded indefinitely, but that was fine, because I had nowhere to go. My friends were all dead. No one in town would acknowledge me. On grocery trips, I would follow at my parents' heels, trying to ignore all the people staring at me from down the aisles. I heard that Suzanne was in therapy, and I was glad, because that meant she was alive and the spirit hadn't checked off the next name on its list. 
My parents eschewed the need for a psychiatrist and took me straight to a priest instead. He pried for details of the ritual and everything that happened after. He prayed with me for hours. It was funny to me because even after explaining what happened to Tommy G and Reggie and Franco, no one actually believed it was black magic or spirits that had brought about their death. Tommy G and Reggie were victims of accidents, they said, and Franco had killed himself because he was frightened and depressed and didn't know better. Strange that no one actually believed in the ritual's power, but I was still punished as if it were our fault. It was early April by the time I was finally able to leave the house on my own again. Even then, I had to check in with my parents every half hour and provide a detailed itinerary of everything I was up to. Spring was just around the corner, and the snow was melting everywhere that received steady sunlight. I got an email from Suzanne late one night. She was coming home to visit her parents for the weekend. She wasn't allowed to see me, but she wanted to sneak out anyway so that we could talk. She said she was doing well and that therapy was helping her cope. She hadn't seen any more spirits. She had spent those first weeks, after Franco's passing, terrified that her own death was hiding in every shadow, but when it didn't come, her fear began to fade. She seemed optimistic in her email. That made me feel better, too. She asked me to go to the clearing again and see if our snow angels had melted. If they were gone, she wrote, then she could finally feel safe. I didn't tell my parents about the email, but Suzanne's parents must have tipped them off because they kept a tight leash on me all that week. Once again, I was confined to the house and my desire to return to that clearing one last time burned like a raging fire in my gut. Finally, the day of Suzanne's flight, I managed to persuade my parents to let me walk to the dollar store. I told them I had a project for school and needed to grab a few craft supplies. I would go straight there and hurry back. I promised. And they agreed. The neighborhood was wet and bleak with only a few piles of dirty snow still lining the streets. As soon as I was out of sight of my house, I headed for the woods. Buds were forming in the branches and the sound of birds and barking squirrels had returned. The ground was black with mud as I walked among the trees. Now and then I stopped to look towards the sky where, somewhere inside those billowing gray clouds, Suzanne was barreling across the world on a commercial airliner. I smiled. Seeing Suzanne after so long would give me the first inkling of closure that I needed. I was sure of it. In the clearing, the shade of the trees had preserved a patchy blanket of snow. The pentagram had melted away. Sissy's dried-up brown blood had faded into the stump. A long tract of snow remained where our snow angels had been made on that terrible Friday. But the snow angels themselves had melted away, and I could only make out a rough outline of them composed of mud and standing water. I stood at the foot of Suzanne's snow angel and stared up at the sky in hopes that I would catch a glimpse of her plane flying by, and I took a deep breath before kneeling down to check the snow angel for any blemishes. There was no blood, no bile, no ice, nothing. I let out a sigh of relief. I closed my eyes tight and smiled. It was over. I opened my eyes. Then, thump. Like a hammer from the sky, a blackbird plummeted out of thin air and slammed into the ground, right where Suzanne's snow angel had laid. Now, far be it from us to tell you what not to do. But if you really want to play around with the supernatural, feel free. After all, the snow angels are eager to make your soul their plaything too. Following a final imported message from our producer, we think him slightly mad sometimes, we will bring you the latest news from the Simply Scary Podcast and information on how you, yes, you, can be a part of our broadcast. Once again, thank you, GM, and thank you, listeners, for joining us for our broadcast. I want to speak directly to those in our audience with a project that needs attention. We have a fantastic opportunity for you, your project, your business, or event. 
you can become a sponsor of the Simply Scary Podcast. With over 150,000 subscribers on YouTube, we can put your message in front of our audience and make it relevant to them, resulting in a better conversion rate for you. If you are interested in sponsorship opportunities during our show, click on the advertise link at the top of the page on simplyscarypodcast.com and set up a free consultation to find out how you can support this quality program and how we can best lend our support to you. And now, I return you to the capable hands of our host. Welcome back, dear friends. This is the part of the show for important information in the world of the Simply Scary Podcast and our affiliates. First, if you are enjoying our broadcast, take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave a review with five stars. No, not four, not three, not even two, although one would be a nice deviation from five, don't you think? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, was that a joke? Oh, heavens. Mm, I might be jeopardizing my position here if I suggest one. Yeah, you better watch it, Chief. Uh, that is five stars, as I said earlier. That will assure we get this new podcast off to a great start. All jokes aside, just search Simply Scary on iTunes and find us at the top of the results. In appreciation for your participation... We will be choosing a review every week to read on the air. We will also choose a review and present that lucky individual with a complimentary membership to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com. This week's review is from pre b we b and they write, Not to say the content is bad, but the stories have been recycled from the YouTube channel I'm sure that I've listened to the stories featured in the first episode already, and I don't see a reason why I should subscribe if there's nothing new. From what I've read, the producers are looking to add new material in the future. Thus, I will check back in some time down the road. If there is new material, I will change my rating to five stars. Thank you for your comment, Preby Weeby. Now, we are not ones to shy away from honest conversation... So let me respond that we have heard your request and we are working diligently to produce brand new material for this podcast. We certainly appreciate your patience and we want to assure you that we are listening and welcome your feedback to help us improve the show. Quite frankly, we welcome reviews and questions like yours because it allows us to reveal some of our future plans for the podcast and let you, the audience, know what is upcoming for the Simply Scary Podcast. We would also be remiss if we did not remind you where the scare is this Halloween. Our friends from Chilling Tales for Dark Nights will be having the final round of the first ever truly fan-chosen talent competition, Evil Idol. You can help them choose the winner and enjoy live performances from the top competitors. Find out who receives the grand prize package and who will be the next star performer for their incredible audio productions. Plus, enjoy enthralling live readings from all of the unbelievably talented artists vying for the top skull, uh, uh, that is, top spot. Subscribe to their YouTube channel, at youtube.com forward slash chilling tales wi and join them there on monday october 31st at 9 p.m central standard time to vote up or eliminate the final contestants thumbs up or thumbs down you decide the victor we would also like to thank you for your support and reiterate that it is incredibly important for our productions. If you have not yet, become a patron today, and you can have access to all our episodes and much more, including access to the exclusive Chilling Tales for Dark Nights audio library in the highest quality possible. Just go to simplyscarypodcast.com and click on the Patrons link at the top of the page, 
As a bonus, when you become a patron, we will also provide some goodies never released to the general public, including isolated music tracks and short films for offline viewing. You do know that every subscription helps us scare you. Finally, and perhaps most important of all, if you are a horror author yourself with a story or book you'd like us to adapt, we have a plethora of voice actors standing by that can help us adapt your work into an audiobook at competitive rates. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us through our contact page on simplyscarypodcast.com or at contact at chillingtalesfordarknights.com. We can provide you with a great opportunity to terrify new audiences. If you are interested in sponsorship opportunities for your business or event during our show, click on the advertise link at the top of the page on simplyscarypodcast.com. Also, if you have a story you want us to feature on the show, visit simplyscarypodcast.com forward slash submit a story and we'll see if your story has what it takes to make our blood run cold. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. I'm your host, GM Danielson, reminding you that if you try to escape from one demon, you could just be getting closer to another one. We will see you next time when we show you there's nothing simple about scary, unless it is the Simply Scary Podcast. This is executive producer Jesse Cornett. If you like what you hear, be sure to check out more from these authors at simplyscarypodcast.com. There you can find all information regarding the show and the stories appearing here in our podcast. The Simply Scary Podcast is a production of Chilling Entertainment. The showcase is written by Jesse Cornett and Dustin Kosky and produced by Jesse Cornett. The host of the Simply Scary Podcast is GM Danielson. Original music during the show by Jesse Cornett. This broadcast was directed and created by Craig Groshek. Be sure to look for the Simply Scary Podcast on iTunes. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star review. Comments or questions? Email us at contact at simplyscarypodcast.com and check our website for more information. While you're there, consider clicking on the patrons link at the top of the page to help support our show. Copyright Chilling Entertainment LLC 2016. Thanks for listening. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.